Code Talker by Joseph Bruchak, published by the Penguin Group. Please excuse the mispronunciation of any Navajo words. Chapter 7 Navajos Wanted. Over the next days, we learned more about the air raid on Hawaii. We heard the names of islands thousands of miles away where the Japanese were attacking American and Allied bases in the Pacific. Even I, who loved geography, had never heard about most of those places. I had to look hard through the maps in my geography book to locate them. Wake Island, Guam, Guadalcanal. By Christmas of 1941, all of those places had fallen to the empire of the rising sun. You must all sacrifice to help the war effort, our teacher said. Even though I understood what they meant, I could not help remembering that we Navajos had already sacrificed a lot. Most of our families were still poor because of the government livestock reduction of our sacred lands. None of our people were as wealthy as any of the Biliganas we saw, especially those who ran the trading posts. Poor as we were, we Navajos really did want to help. Our tribal council met at Window Rock and declared war on Germany, Japan, and Italy. Navajo men took their guns, packed supplies, and rode their horses in to report to the Indian agent. They did not know how far away Pearl Harbor was, but they were ready to go there and fight the enemy. However, almost all of those men were told they could not be warriors for the United States because they only spoke Navajo or because what English they spoke was not good enough. That made them sad and ashamed. I wanted to join up too and go fight the enemy. I could speak English well, but I was only 14 when that attack came on Pearl Harbor. That was far too young, and I was too small to convince anyone that I was older. This war will be over, I said to my friends, before I'm old enough to enlist. At first, that is what many people thought. Now that America has declared war, Mr. Strait said, shaking his bony finger at the sky, the fighting will soon be over. Everyone on the radio and in the newspapers agreed. The Axis powers, that was what they called Japan, Germany, and Italy, would quickly crumble. Sadly, we were all wrong. As the months wore on, it became clear that this war was going to be a long one. It also seemed that the U.S. Armed Forces was yet another place where Indians were not wanted. Only a few Navajos had been accepted as U.S. soldiers, all of them men who had been to mission school. There seemed little interest in the part of the U.S. Armed Services in enlisting the help of those who had loved this country long before the ancestors of the Biliganas came here. Then, in April of 1942, everything changed. A message from Chi Dodge, our Navajo tribal chairman, was sent around the reservation by shortwave radio. A Marine recruiter was coming to Fort Defiance, looking for Indian volunteers. Not just any Indians, but Navajos. Navajos were needed for special work. The Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs had given its sanction for Navajos to join up. However, only men fluent in both English and Navajo were wanted. When I heard that announcement on the radio, I could hardly speak. Navajos, I finally managed to say to my friends. Navajos, they want Navajos. Did you hear that? I was so excited and talking so fast that they teased me. Are you sure that's what they said? Tommy Nez asked me. We oui, he, Jesse Chi said. Yeah, didn't they say they wanted Mexicans? But that radio announcement interested those guys, too. Our high school was not far from the tribal offices in Fort Defiance. The Marine Corps recruiter was scheduled to speak the next morning, a Saturday, which meant we had no classes to attend. So the three of us went down there together, just to look at that recruiter. He had been given an office right near our Navajo tribal headquarters, and we could see that the door was open. We quietly crept up and peeked through the door. A tall, broad-shouldered white man wearing a neat, well-pressed uniform sat at a desk. He seemed very serious. 
He sat with his back straight, writing something on a pad of paper. Perhaps it was the recruiting speech that he was about to give. We were perfectly quiet. I'm sure he did not notice us peering in. He was impressive to see. But what was even more impressive were the things that hung on the walls around him. Look at that, Jesse Chi whispered, pointing with his chin. We looked. There hung a beautiful sword in a silver case. Just below it was a fine rifle. To either side of the rifle and sword were posters that showed Marines standing tall in their full dress uniform. One of them, in the most colorful poster of all, looked much like the recruiting sergeant himself. However, the uniform of that poster Marine was much more striking than his. That uniform! Ah, it was so beautiful to behold. The coat and trousers were made of cloth that was as shining and blue as the sky. The cap and gloves were white as clean new snow. The leather boots were as black and polished as jet. Did you see the uniform in that picture, Tommy Nez said, after we were back out in the street? Boy, that was sharp. I'd sign up just to have a uniform like that one. The three of us decided to hang around until that straight-backed white Marine gave his talk at 11 a.m. It was quite a speech. My name is First Sergeant Frank Shin, he said in a loud, clear voice as he stood on the steps of the tribal offices, looking out at the crowd of people who had gathered around. Looking back on that day, I wonder what he thought of those Navajos gathered there in front of him. Some in the crowd, like my friends and me, were short-haired and dressed much like any white man would dress. Only the brown of our faces gave away the fact that we were something other than the usual people who would hear such a recruiting speech. But there were also many in that small crowd who were far different from those he was probably used to seeing. There were men with blankets over their shoulders and rifles in their arms, men wearing headbands or tall black hats, women in long, colorful dresses with shawls. The glitter of silver and the glow of turquoise shone out from that crowd in the shape of necklaces and bracelets and earrings on the women, belt buckles and hat bands on the men. No one stared up at the first sergeant, yet there was complete silence as he spoke. I am a Marine, and proud to be one, First Sergeant Shin continued, his voice echoing down the street. He looked around the crowd as if daring anyone to contradict him. The Marines need a few good men. There will be real opportunity for you if you enlist. It will be better for you than staying here on the reservation. As a Marine, one of the proud and few, you will have the chance to travel, learn new skills, and meet interesting people. Of course, he did not mention that some of the interesting people you would meet might be holding guns and sharp samurai swords, shouting Banzai and trying to kill you. If he had, I still do not think it would have frightened away any Navajo recruits, even though some who enlisted that day and in the days following figured that they were heading for some kind of desk job and not into combat. It seemed to me that this marine recruiter was telling us the truth. We Navajos have listened to white men speak for a long time, and we have learned to tell when one is trying to deceive us. You can tell a lot about a man by the way he speaks, and the way he carries himself. Looking at First Sergeant Shin, I could see that this was indeed a man who believed in what he said. I was ready to believe it, too. I wanted to become one of the proud, and the few. But there was a problem. They were only accepting men between the ages of 17 and 32. I was still only 15 years old. Yes, grandchildren, that was quite a problem. But right away, I thought I saw a solution. In those days, none of us had birth certificates. Nearly all of us were born at home and not in hospitals, with only our families and a midwife present. As a result, the only way the Billy Ghanas knew the age of any Navajo was based on what age that person of the person's family said. If my parents claimed I was old enough, I could enlist. I went home and told my parents what I wanted them to do. They listened carefully. Son, my mother said, wait outside while your father and I talk of, talk of this. I did as they asked. As I sat leaning against the wall of our Hogan with the warm sun on my face, I could hear their soft voices speaking, but I could not understand what they were saying. A lizard ran up to my feet, stopped, bobbed up and down, and then ran off again. Finally, my parents called me back in. Son, my father said, we are proud of you. What you want to do is a good thing. However, your mother and I both think that 
that you are not yet old enough. You are still too young to become a Marine. Wait through another winter. If this war is still going on, then we will give you our blessing to join up. I was disappointed, but I did as they asked and went back to school. So it was that I was not part of the first Navajo platoon, those 29 men who developed our secret code. Yo we oh hey yo we oh hey yo we oh hey yo we oh